Yeah, I've been talking about our corporate identity, and I just feel to continue with that. And um, I believe that God wants you to know who you are and what you're part of, because I believe that if you don't know who you are, it'll be very difficult for you to know what you're born to do and what you're called to do. In fact, a blurry vision of who you are will paralyze your vision of what you're called to do. That's why identity is a very strong thing. Especially when it comes to a church, collectively speaking. God wants everyone here that God has put a call on your heart to be part of this church to know what the church is all about. Because you can't be loosely attached to the church. You can't be loosely attached even to your family because the family that you're part of, God has given your family a unique identity and a unique calling in life. What is an organization or even a village or a community or city or nation. We've got to come back to God and ask, why am I here and why am I part of this and what's, what's the deal, God? And I felt to talk about this continue from uh, two weeks ago when I talk about the corporate identity because I feel like God wants to establish this church in who we are so that he can launch all of us out to do massive things for God. Amen. And as I'm speaking here today, please, I just want you to really buy into these things because um, this is who, what you're part of. This is the collective identity somehow define also who you are as an individual. So, you know, and, and we talk about the first thing that we need to understand, to understand ourselves, we've got to understand why God's called us breakthrough. Uh, the name, and this is something I want to ask the mom and dads in this place, be careful in how you name your kids. Make sure that you name your kids according to God's naming. Otherwise, you know, because when God gives you a name for a person, there's deep meaning in it. In fact, in the naming of people, there is your character, there is your attitude, and even what you're called to do in life is somehow locked up in the name. Like, my name is David. Uh, I thank God for the person that named me Tevita, which is my first name in Tongan, Tevita. Uh, Kavenga second name, you know, but when I grow up, people call me by my second name, Kavenga or Kave. And then I came, I came to Jesus and God said, you are David, a leader and a commander of the people. And I'm like, that's me. You know, there's power in understanding why God called you the name or given you the name that you are. Mom and dad, don't be careful with the name of your kid. Don't, don't get fancy and, and want to call your, your child somebody from Hollywood that end up taking drugs and, you know, commit suicide and all of that stuff. We've got to be careful. Pray to God because in the naming alone, God has given to us our nature, our character, and also our purpose. And the name of Breakthrough is simply because God has given to this church a very strong, unique element of the Breakthrough nature of God. And that's why, you know, when, when you come here and you, and you hear the way we worship and you're like, this is not like the church that I went to last week. It's, it's too... It's too loud and uh, this is who we are. We're breakthrough people. And the breakthrough nature of God resides in this church. And we can't be anything we're not. And there's a strong breakthrough element, which is really apostolic nature of God that he wants to express through churches. For example, breakthrough is different from the church down the road. And I'm not going to try and, you know, be a carbon copy of another church. We're just going to be who we are. And God's called us to be breakthrough. So we've got to be that breakthrough people. There's a breakthrough anointing upon the house. And guess what? When you understand that God has given this church a strong element of his breakthrough character, his breakthrough power, you can have the same thing by just correctly aligning yourself to the church. If you come here to the church and, you know, you start saying things against the church rather than, submitting really to the vision of the house and being part of what God is doing in the church, whatever is on the church can come upon you as an individual, even your marriage and even your kids. You're going to see your kids breaking through in their education, in their sports, breaking through in their social uh, realms because we want the spirit or the dimension of God's element in this church to come upon every person, every couple in here and even your kids. We're going to be a breakthrough church, so we're going to act like it and live like it and be it. Amen. Somebody say amen. And you know from the Bible, you know, this is recap really because some of you were not here. But you know, this is how David found out the breakthrough God, the breakthrough nature of God. And in 1 Corinthians, I think the slides are up there. When he saw God broke through against his enemy like waters breaking through his hands. And God said to me, you know, when he said to me, call this church breakthrough. And I say, why? And he said, because I want to reveal my breakthrough nature through this church. In other words, nothing is impossible with us. Nothing can stand 
in the ways, in our ways, especially when God said, this is where you're going. Any giants or mountains or whatever resistance or whatever opposition that come against this church, it's going to come down. You know why? The breakthrough God will break out. Oh, shikabahai tai. And that's why I, 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 just, I just believe that we can do anything. But of course, it has to be within the parameters of God's will. You don't have that faith and you just go out and do anything that God never called you to do. But whatever it is that God has assigned for this church to do, whether it's in the community or nations, guess what, church? We can do it! Ah, oh, man, I love this Presbyterian church right here, right now. I said, whatever God's called us to do, we can do it! Why? The breakthrough God is in this house. He's called us breakthroughs so we can break through and not break down or break away. <laughs> Number two, this is recap uh, actually. We are called to be a multicultural church. Somebody say, yay! You know, and I've heard people say, oh, you go to that Islander church. We're not an Islander church! Just because the pastor was born in Tonga and grew up in New Zealand, I have a New Zealand passport, it doesn't mean that you label me based on all this natural perspective. We are called to be multicultural. Look around at this house. And I see what God told me it's going to be. This is a microcosm of the macro picture. We're going to have 10,000, maybe 20,000 colorful people, colorful church, people of all color, races and culture just coming in here because it's not because your pastor is handsome, but the God in me is the God of every person. Somebody say amen. And this is a church for all people, all color, all race, all whatever language you speak. God is saying breakthrough is a multicultural church. In fact, I received this word when I was still ministering in Tonga. And I think I saw some of my friends here from Tonga. Um, but when I was there, you know, for seven years, the Lord said to me, if you're faithful with, to me in Tonga, I'm going to take you to a nation where I'm going to give you the nations of the world. I'm seeing it here right now. And I'm seeing the future of this church Mega church changing the nations because whatever nations is represented here, those are the nations we're going to. Somebody say amen in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> Woo, I am so excited in here. My spirit, I, my spirit wants to leap out like a lion and scratch some of you. <laughs> and you know what? The kingdom of God, this is, and I said this last week, I just want to read this to you again. This is really the ultimate destination for us is in Revelation 7, 9. Look at this. And all these things I looked and behold, I'm great multitude. This is the ultimate place where we are going. Oh my gosh, I feel like running now. And then he said, um, which no one could number. All nations, tribes, people, and tongues standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. And I'm sure, you know what they were doing? Worshipping the Lamb day and night. That's where we're going. So there's no section for the Samoan uh, over there and uh, the Tongans over here. Or there's a different heavens for the Tongans. I think there's a different heavens for the Tongans. When we get to heaven, we're all going to stand right next to each other. We're going to worship God together right next to each other. The Brazilian are going to be, we've got Brazilian people in this house. We've got the Kiwis here, Australians, we've got the Tongans, we've got the Samoans, we've got the Rantongans, we've got, the, we've got everybody in this place. So if, if we're going to a place where all is one, all is equal, all standing to each other, worshiping our King and our Lord, why don't we get it right, right here, right now? Amen. So I'm telling you, we're called to be a multi, multi-cultural church. And I want you to get comfortable with people in this place. And I just want to ask the white folks, uh, look beyond this beautiful chocolate color. Because the God you love is living inside of me. And the God that I love lives inside of you. And even, even the, the brown folks, look, the way we see, let's just be colorblind. Let's just be cultural blind. Please, for goodness sake, get over your issues. Amen. Can we just get over all this whatever, perspective, preferences, prejudice, and just see God in everybody? Because if you cut my skin, I will bleed red. If I cut your skin, you'll bleed red. If I cut uh, Connie's skin, bleed red. 
bleed red, bleed red, bleed red. We have all one blood flowing through our veins with one color, and that's the color red. Our God is a good God. Amen. We've got to look beyond the natural and see what God has given to all of us because he's calling this church to be a multicultural church. I love it. It's like the rainbow church. I loved having the Maoris here, the white Kiwis and the brown Kiwis and the black Kiwis. We need to have the Asians. We need to have more Asians in this church. And so, ladies and gentlemen, whenever you people say to you, oh, you're going to that brown church, I want to say, don't you ever say that again. It's not a brown church. Our pastor is actually very handsome. <laughs> and it doesn't mean that he's running a brown church. And that's what I'm hearing, Islander church. Come on, come on. Do I say to you, do you go to a white church? I don't. Do I say to you, do you go to a Kiwi church? I don't. Church is church. God is God. He's the God of all people. Amen. <laughs> Somebody say amen to that. And we're called to be a generational church. See the kids that walk out there? That's the future. And the, our God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there's a verse there. Again, this is recap because some of you were not here. But I feel in my spirit that you've got to hear this. <laughs> and he said that the generation to come might know them, God and his word. That the children who would be born will also know them. That they, may be, that they may arise and declare to their children. Three generations right there. God is saying that your God, God of Abraham, must, must, your son Isaac must know me. And your son Jacob must know me. And it's your responsibility to transfer my knowledge and make me known to the next generations and generations to come. Fathers, can I ask you here today? Stop mucking around and make sure that God is real in your life. Because your sons will grow up to copy exactly what you are. I said, well, but I tried to get them to church. Monkey do what monkey sees. They don't do what they hear. These kids want to see something authentic in us that they want to grow up and say, I want to be like daddy. And moms, we've got to raise up our daughters. And please make sure that Jesus is real at home. Make sure that God is practicing at home by the hugs and the loves and the forgiveness. Everybody has fights. We all have conflicts. But can you just sort it out? They always have to talk about, well, you know, call the police. When they see cops coming to your house every, every weekend, they want to grow up and produce the same family with cops coming to their house every weekend. We've got to change for the sake of this kid. Somebody say, yay. We've got to change. Because what you do right now, they're going to grow up to do the same thing. And thank God my brother and I, Richard, where's Richard? I can't see Richard. We came from a family like that where what we saw was absolutely devastating. And, and then I, I'm sure Richard said the same thing. I said to God, when I get married, my family is not going to be like that. And you know what? Thank you, Jesus, for breaking the curse, generational curse. <laughs> Honestly, I'm a free man from whatever that come from my family. And Richard, my brother, is free. And I'm saying this to, to say to you, you can be free too. Your God is a God that can break generations, generational issues and bondage and strongholds and curses. He can come deep into your life and cut them all off and set you free forever. So that your kids will grow up with a new lineage, which is God's lineage. Not your cultural lineage, not your family lineage. It is God's lineage that your kids will start living and, 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 and emulating in this world. They don't have to bow down to all the things out there. Did you know that this world is getting wicked? Have you seen the news lately? Activists this and pro this and it's all for the wrong things. But we need to raise up a generation that when we're not here, we can hear them from the other side saying, the God of our fathers is real. The God of our grandfather, fathers and mothers is real. And we're not going to compromise. We're not going to allow this world to take us out. We're going to stand in our generation, our time, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and never compromise and never bow down to the powers of this world or the rulers of this world. We will never bow down because the God of our fathers is real. So whatever you're doing right now goes a long way in many generations. So we got to get our act together. The mom and dads who are alive in this room right now. 
Because those kids, they walk out there. They're looking to us for models and examples and, and ways that they could use in their time and in gener generations. Amen. I love these kids. Every time I talk about them, man, my heart just goes nuts. I do love these kids. Your kids, I love your kids. I love my kids and I love your kids too. And that's why I believe that we got to do church right. We got to make sure that this house is built for them. We got to make sure that we don't come here and tear the house down. Well, we'll build this house for the next generation. That when we're long gone, our kids will have a platform. We'll have a spiritual home for their own time and their own kids. They'll have money. They'll have land. They'll have building. They'll have everything because we saw the future and we built for the future. Somebody shout amen in this place. I'm not building something for the here and now. I'm building something for the future. We've got to prepare for the future. And we've got to have that mindset. The God mindset to see what's coming in the future and preempt that and start building for it. Because you know what? If you want to have a good legacy, you've got to have this vision about the future. And you've got to be generational in your thinking and even in your prayer. And don't neglect those kids right now because I'm telling you, you are their number one role model. Where else are they going to see Jesus? But at home first. Where else are they going to see God? Not at the school. Do you see what's happening in the schools today? That's just the way the world is. But we believe in a God that is awesome and real. And we've got to start living life. Show them Jesus at home. Amen. All right. And fight to stay together and stop talking about divorce. And I hate you. I keep those knives where they should be. And the cups and the plates, they're expensive to buy new cups and plates. Some of us are just doing all these, uh, what you call, matrix at home. Where you, <laughs> you know, keep the, they're expensive to buy. If you're angry, go for a walk and talk to Jesus. Men, do not talk, turn to the bottles. And turn to your marijuana you used to, you know, it's like alleviate the pressure. Don't turn to these things. Go and talk to Jesus. That's how I do with my issue. I have issues. I have conflicts. Oh, you know what I do? I say, honey, don't talk right now. I got to go for a walk. Because if I, if, I, if I don't go for a walk, we're going to end up hitting each other. And by the way, Tina hits harder than me. <laughs> I walk and I just talk to him. And he calms me down. I come home. And it prevents me from going on the internet, calling out ex-girlfriends, tracing your past pathways to those drug dealers. What are you doing? Your kids want to do the same thing if you do that right now. Mm hmm Are you happy? Because I am. You look angry. Bless the Lord. <laughs> I'm glad that you're a bit, a bit disturbed today. I want to disturb you. I do want to disturb you. So you go home and think about life. Amen. God is a good God. Amen. You are married, right? Man, you're married to a beautiful woman. Look after that woman. And mom and dad, you got beautiful kids. Look after those kids. All right. We are a family-oriented church because the Lord's call us uh, not only to bring in the families, biologically speaking, because this area here, the Democratic in Springfield, is mainly 70 to 80% young families. And that's why we're having all our programs sort of adjusted to cater for the young families. And um, we want to see mom and dad and the kids. And I was saying to somebody the other day, you know, our kids' ministry average around 70 to 80 on a good day. They're like, what? That's bigger than many churches I know. I said, yeah, because our strategy is to bring in the families. You know, a lot of you come in here with five, six. I think we're going to have... 10 kids soon from some of the families but we've got to build a church for families we have men's ministry we're women's ministry we're a family ministry and when we call you uh, call you and uh, let you know about family ministry bring the family <laughs> thank you Joe <laughs> bring the family bring the familia let's get together and have an Italian moment you know what I'm saying you know what I'm saying 
Hã? Join the mafioso. <laughs> I want to read this to you because I, I, I know this is recap, but I feel like they just say it again. Please forgive me for being excited. We are family first before we are servants and laborers and an army of God. We're family first. You can't go to battle with people you don't know. They don't trust. I'd rather go to battle with my family. You know why? Because when enemy comes, my wife is going to protect my back. Because she loves me too much to leave my back uncovered. But you don't want to go to battle with people. You don't like you and you don't like them. That's why we got to be a family and open up and get to know people and love you, love your brother, love your sister, holy kiss, holy handshakes, all the holy things, you know. Make sure it flows in the house of the Lord. <laughs> when the battle comes, you're like, I got ya. Don't look back, I've got ya. I'm, I'm going to be your armor bearer. Arrows come, I'm going to protect you. See, that's what we need. We need this church to be a family church. And, and of course, it's not just biological, but also spiritual. We want this church to be a church where everybody sees everybody here as brothers and sisters. And, you know, and I mentioned the, uh, a couple of weeks back that some people call me and Tina mom and dad. And this is not for you to call us mom and dad. But it, it's, it's family language, really. It shows that their hearts have really come to accept that this is a family church. And we have uncle and aunties in this house and yeah. <laughs> we are called to be a vibrant, dynamic and exuberant church. Somebody say amen. I don't like going to a lifeless church. I will die. I don't like going to a church that have a, a form of life expressions but really dead inside. I want to go to a church that is full of life. You know why? Jesus is life. You know, the Bible tells us, and there's a scripture there, he comes to give us life and life more abundantly. My God, our king is alive. I have to wear the sticks. You're lucky I would have put holes in that thing. Jesus is alive! Somebody say amen! He is the life and the resurrection. He is alive in you, he's alive in me. You know why I talk like I talk? Like I do, <laughs> cause I he is alive. I know and I believe it. And many people say, you know, you, you, you're always excited, David. I mean, how, why, why not? Why can't I be? I used to, I used to be dead. I used to smoke a lot to keep myself alive. I used to drink a lot to keep alive. I used to have all these. I don't want to talk about it. It's ugly to keep myself alive. At least to keep myself feeling like I'm alive. But when I met Jesus, oh. What's your issue, man? What's your problem? You're Christian. Jesus is inside of you. Why are you acting like that? And I was saying the other day, maybe we should cast Jesus out of you. What a waste. Why call yourself a Christian and you look like you're not? <laughs> you know how we cast the devil out of people? Of course we don't cast Jesus. I said, Jesus, leave that person, please. Misrepresenting you. Leave, please, Jesus. But I know he's not like that. You see, and that's the thing. He's so good. He's so awesome. But anyway, we are vibrant, dynamic, and exuberant church. Somebody say, yay! We are creative and innovative. Oh! I, <laughs> I think I was talking to some people a couple of weeks back. And they said, you know, your church is just different. The sound is different. It doesn't sound like other churches. And I'm not being mean by saying this, but you go to other churches like... There's a monopoly going on in the churches where we all sing Hillsong songs. Nothing wrong. But where is your own creativity? Where's your uniqueness? Where's the songs God has given to you? Do you always have to sing other people's songs? Why don't you write your own song, play your own song, and sing your own song, and dance your own dance? And do we always have to follow everybody? I'm not saying that all the songs are bad. I sing a lot of the, you know, Hillsong songs. But the Lord is saying, no, 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 no. I've given you something. I am the creative God living inside of you. Access my creativity and do something and bring something to the world that they have never seen before. Write music, create dance, start a business, start a family that lives on trees. <laughs> Start something. Come on. Get out of this. 
this, this, this thing that has imprisoned all of us and be creative of the God who lives inside of you. He's such a creative God. Dress your kids differently. You don't have to dress like everybody else. And I'm not saying you're going to do that. I'm just trying to get the message across, amen? Be yourself and be creative. The God who created all things live inside of you. Somebody say, amen. amen. Well, we're going to write our own music. We're going to create our own pro Icon was a product of us just asking God, what do you want us to do? God said, icon. Whatever that means, I don't know, but just do it or I slap your face. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> you, you have not seen creativity, I'm telling you. You know what? I keep saying to people, we need to create a new genre in music and dance. Why do we always have reggae or Bob Marley, rock and roll or Elvis Presley? Can't we just create something new? Create a new genre and get the whole world to sing it and follow you. As if our gods run out of ideas. Hello? You're the only one that ran out of ideas because you're your son of that person we know that no, I'm just kidding <laughs> that was a joke guys and here's here's something that I need to uh, share with you and I've only got 10 minutes and these are the new things I need to give you today so please write these down we're called to be bold and uncompromising we're called to be fearless and I was just praying for Edwina Fear is the thing that has paralyzed a lot of people. But our God is a God that has given us not the spirit of fear and timidity, but the spirit of power, love, and sound mind. My God, I can tell you that I used to be a very fearful person. Public speaking was not my thing. When the Lord called me this, to, to preach, I knew that it has to do with public speaking. Fear gripped my heart. And I was on, going on this long walk in Wellington, and I said, God, if you're really calling me to preach, I know what it means that I have to face people. And this is what I said, God, please break the spirit of fear. Man, the next week I was speaking to this group of people, boldness came out of me. I started roaring inside of me like the lion of the tribe of Judah. Because it was no longer David Vaca, it was Jesus in David Vaca coming through with so much power and boldness. You're probably thinking, David, is it hard for you to speak in front of people at church? Yeah, yeah, you know what, in the past I would have just disappeared. But now I still have those you know, thoughts come here and say, you can't do it. But I'm leaning on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm leaning on the power from on high. And when I stand in front of people, I'm not standing here as David Vaca. I'm just standing here representing God in me is going to do the work. It's going to do the job. He has given us so much power to break fear and timidity upon your life. And in fact, I feel like God's going to break fear of all of you here today. We are called to be bold, uncompromising fearless generation somebody say amen because a lot of things God spoke to you to do your heart says yes but your mind says no it's the fear you know why because you have experienced things in the past that fail and that voice of the enemy reminds you of how ugly it was but if God is saying to you today do this or do that I want you to know that you can do it I can do all things through Jesus Christ and strengthen me because the fear is not of God it's of the devil We've got to be free from the fear even of death. You know, when the whole thing of 9-11 uh, uh, happened, something actually, that fear came back on me because I, I was traveling a lot, flying from this place, that place, and 9-11 happened. And, and I look at my wife and I look at my kids and I went, I don't want to get on the plane again. What if something happened to me? And I, I, I don't want my life. I don't want to be taken out prematurely. I want to spend a lot of time with my, my, my wife and kids. It's like that thing that the enemy reminded you of fear. But you know what? One thing the Lord said to me, to conquer your fear, you've got to do the very thing you're afraid of. Like my bags went to the, went to the airport <laughs> and standing there, I said, I'm going to get on that plane. I don't care what this mind is saying to me. I'm going to get on that plane. And you know what? I got on the plane a couple of times. It was over. It was gone. You know what? Our God does not give us the spirit of fear and or bondage to fear, even the fear of death. But he's given us the spirit of power love and sound mind don't be afraid of death rather be excited about that day because you're living a good life and you can't wait to meet God and hear him say well done good and faithful servant you know what if you live your life fearing God and not fearing man you live a life of boldness and power I fear God I don't fear you 
I love you, but I don't fear you. Now you're probably saying, whoa, the pastor's getting a little bit cocky here. No, it's because I know the God that I serve. If, if, in my own human element without God, I'm a fearful person. But when we are talking about the God who lives inside of us, I do not fear any man. I only fear one thing and one person. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. And you know what? If you live to fear God, you live to please him and not please men. And that's why in many churches, I feel sorry for pastors who are controlled by, by the elders and controlled by the demons, sorry, the deacons, um, um, controlled by the members. And they're so fearful of men, they can't even do what God is saying to do. But in this church, I'm, I just want to set the record correct. I'm going to fear him above you to do what he's telling us to do. Somebody say amen to that. Is it, am I saying that I'm loving? No, I'm loving you too much to succumb to the pressure and the control of people. I'd rather be controlled by him and be free to do what he's saying because that's going to good, be good for you in the long run. If I obey God because I fear him, I tell you this, you're going to live in blessings all the time. Men of God in the house, fear God. Obey him at any cost. And don't allow your wives to tell you otherwise. They're great. But there's the Eve element that always comes into us through women, which are beautiful, our treasures. But just make sure that, you know, those moments comes, put your foot down. And say, honey, I love you and I love your advice. But this is what God is saying. Follow me. <laughs> Man, there's a spirit of fear in this place. No one is saying amen. Man. There's a spirit of fear in here. I can sense fear in this place because you're sitting next to your woman. She's going to Alba, as Bobby Alba you already. She's going to harass you at home tonight. Come on, man. I'm not saying that we just, you know, disrespect our wives, but you've got to obey God, man, and lead the family where God wants you to go. And she might follow you with her heels in the ground, but you keep going because later on she'll look at you and say, thank you for following Jesus. Amen. Women are just created to be complicated. <laughs> it's true. I'm married to one. It's like I'm married to a hundred women in one body. But it's just the way it is. But you know what, man? It's our responsibility to hear his voice and say, God, I'm going. And man, you know what? On Sunday, let me give you a little practical example. Come Sunday and your wife says, the kids are tired and you want to come to church? Man, nicely, in a very nice, loving way, say to that beautiful woman of yours, I'm going to church. Whether you're coming or not, I love this God. I want to know him. I want to pursue him. And you know what, man? If you just make a decision to go to church and go to a place where you can interact and encounter your God, that woman will have energy. And she said, oh, you're not leaving without us. Come on, kids, get up, get up, get up. <laughs> well, some of us are so environmentally controlled. Oh, it's too hot. <laughs> yeah, but you can go and sit at a, a cricket game all day and put stuff on your face and just, yeah, yeah act like an idiot. <laughs> Amen. Why don't you do that for your God? I'm talking to the men in this house. Where are the men in here? Where are the men in the house? I want to hear you say, oh, 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 where are the men? Meow, meow, meow. <laughs> you see, some of us men, we're, we're just so committed when it comes to the guys, the blokes. Have a few drinks, honey. I'm going. I'm sorry, baby. I already told you that last week. See you later. Man, if you put the same passion and commitment to pursuing God, you'll be a different man. Be stubborn in God. Don't be stubborn in the things that are only good for your flesh. Be stubborn in Jesus. And all the ladies say, see, this is what they want. This is what they want. They want you man to be a man of God. And don't be afraid of them. <laughs> you go to church I'll leave you then leave me I don't care go see how far you can go she's not going to go away. she's just going to go from the bedroom to the other bedroom and come back and wait for you make dinner for you they're just all these scare tactics we've been through that mate 
We've been through that. We've been through that. Come on. There's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> you love Jesus? Yeah, I'm telling you this is this is it. I tell you I love my wife. But when God says go, I'm gone. <laughs> it's true she knows it. If you don't believe me, come and ask her. Really, David? Yes, really. Honestly, really. Of course, I still listen to her, but I still talk with her. But at the end of the day, I've got to make that final decision. You've got to be willing to make those hard decisions. You're my baby, honey. And please, ladies, if your husband is not here, go home and say, hey, we'll do that again. Next, next Sunday, you have to lead us to church. Amen. As ladies to do a man's job. Come on. Come on. And here's what the Bible said, but you shall receive power. Duman is power. That word just escaped my, 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 my mouth. But it's power when the Holy Spirit come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. And see, this is some of us. I can't do it. I can't witness. I can't do the business. I can't. I can't. I can't. And God said, I've given you power. Power to do what you. I know you can't do it. That's why I'm saying to you, come to me. Without me, you're useless. And they'll call you useless. And your kids will be called useless. And all this generation, well, call, you might as well call your last name, family name, useless. But I have called you to be a man of God. I've called you to be a man of significance, man of power, man of influence. Blessed nation with the whole land, nation will call you blessed. I've called you that. Come on, come to me. You, you can't do it on your own. You can only do it with me in you. Power! I know we're all fearful. I know there's a human element to all of us. But God is there. And he's saying, come, let me empower you. Let me work through you. Let me break through through you. Let me go through you to that meeting that you're afraid of. Let me speak through you and give you favor in front of business people and politicians. That's why I'm so crazy about doing things for this community. Because you know what? I know our God is bigger than all those hot shots in this area. They're just hot shots. That's all they are. Hot heads. God is king. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords and the god of gods. No one can be compared to him. And when he calls you to do something, you step out and do it. Amen. We're called to be a community and city oriented church. Now, you know we've been doing the Icon show two years now. And the Australia uh, Day, our first one. And look at the impact. It's because that's who we are. And when Tina, poor Tina and Ludi and all the, the team come up here, a church, we're looking for volunteers. Everybody goes home and sleep. It's because you don't know that this is who you're part of. This is who you are. Get out in the community. Come through these platforms. Let's go and take the community for Jesus. Amen. Because sometimes they're not going to come to church, but we can take the church out. Break out of the four walls of this church. Come on. We are a community and city-oriented church. God said, Listen, I, I'm, I'm fearful. That's why some of you, I hope you understand the passion behind doing things for the community. It's not because we want to, it's because he wants to. He commands us to be a church that impacts community and city. And for us to say no, he's going to choose another church. Because we're too lazy and too fearful. We procrastinate too much. We have many excuses why we can't do it. As if you're going to do anything. It's him doing it through you. And we got these things because that's who we are. Change the community. We got five and two crew that are doing works for the community. Many of you, we, got, we need to have businesses from this church that are out there to create jobs and opportunities for people in the community. There's so much we can do. But you know, because we don't know who we are, that's why we kind of like, you know, back off a little bit. But God is saying, no, 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 Breakthrough Church, I've called you to be a community and city-oriented church. Let me give you something that just chopped in my spirit today. Are you ready to hear this? 
I'm praying at home before I came. And I, I was just praying. I said, God, I love you and blah, blah, blah. And God said, David, you've been praying for, to me for Springfield. I'm giving you Ipswich. Not Springfield, Ipswich. I said, wow. The neighbors could hear me screaming in my room. And you know what he said to me? And I'm going to tell you whether you like it or not. You got to hear this. Whether you're here with us or not, I don't care. You're going to miss out anyway. He said, I'm going to give you favor with the mayor. I'm going to give you favor with city council. I'm going to give you favor with the whole, because I've called you here not only to be a church for Springfield, but a church that bring my life back to, to Ipswich. Yeah. Ipswich has been looked upon as kind of like down there compared to other communities and cities. But that's where God gets excited because when everything is all down and out, God can reveal his glory and his power in a place like that. My God, when I said that, I said, that's it. I receive it. God said, I've given you Ipswich. If you don't take this man, then I'll give it to somebody else. And those of you who are doing things in Ipswich, you belong there. Step out and do the things you're doing in Ipswich because we are coming. I said, Ipswich, we are coming. And if we're faithful with Ipswich, he's going to give us Logan City. Oh, yeah. And we're faithful with Logan City. He's going to give us all of Brisbane. And when he has given us all of Brisbane, Queensland, hello. <laughs> Australia, hello. Melanesia, hello. Micronesia, hello. Pacifica, hello. Asia, hello. New York. Yeah. Hey, New York. Yeah. Oh, so you guys are going to go to New York then. Good. The world is your oyster. The world is our Paris. The world is open to all of us. But we've got to be faithful with our own backyards first. Somebody say this with me. Ipswich, Ipswich. Belongs, to Jesus. belongs to Jesus. And I'm telling you, watch. One day, you're going to see people from Ipswich coming here. Because they're feeling the call. We have to accept it for them to feel it. Yeah. If you don't accept the mandate and the call, how are they going to resonate with that spiritually speaking? Because some of them are feeling like, there's a church called Breakthrough and they have a heart for us? We're going. Mommy, daddy, kids, get in the car. Get in the car. <laughs> and we have people that are all the way from uh, beyond Jimbumba. Josh and, uh, and Angela. Angela, by the way, you enjoy that word? I saw you guys. Yeah, good. Oh, thank you, Lord. I was right there from, but that was from God. Anyway, I mean, that's not me, just the Lord. Ipswich belongs to Jesus. I, I was so excited. I went on Facebook and I put on my status today. Ipswich is the city of God. I make declaration. I didn't make it to anybody. I just make it to the devil. I say, hey, you filthy, hairy, ugly thing. Ipswich belongs to Jesus. This is the city of God. <laughs> Amen. Are you feeling good here? And of course, here's what the Bible said. You shall receive power. The Spirit come upon you. And this is what he said. And you will be a witness for me in Jerusalem, which is our Springfield, Judea, Ipswich, Samaria, Logan City, and uh, Forest Lake. No, we leave Forest Lake out. It's, it's a sin city, so we leave Forest Lake out. No? Oh, sorry. Forest Lake. Yes, we include Forest Lake. Okay, okay. Gold Coast knows too sinful. This city, Gold Coast, too sinful. But what am I trying to say? What am I trying to say is we got to start here and move out. From our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. In fact, we already got our ministries all over the world. But the thing is, I feel God is just saying, these people here in this church needs to know. I just came in from our church in Auckland. God is shaking New Zealand through this church. You got to know what you're part of and rise up and become part of it. Not just come here for just my own little blessing with my own little uh, two kids and my husband. Oh, Lord, just bless me. Oh, I feel safe in the house. Oh, this is a good chance to go to. Oh, oh aircon. Oh, music. I love the music. Yeah, enjoy everything, but know what you're part of. Know who you are. Amen. And here's the last one. <laughs> We are called to be a global church. And when I, every time I talk about going to the world, everybody should be saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I forgot the song. Amen. We are 
called to be a global church. It's just part of who we are. Our DNA is to touch the world. You can't escape that. God has given the word, but we've got to start with our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and go to the world. And this is what the Bible said, Mark 16, 15. It said, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We've got a ministry in Tonga. Our pastor in Tonga is literally shaking that nation through our television ministry. We've got PGN, which they make me and, uh, me, Tina, me and Tina president, which is a ministry or network that covers the whole Pacific nations. That's God saying, this is who you are. And I believe that if we are faithful with the Pacific room, God will open Asia to us. The Americas will open up. He said, go to all the world. Of course, to go there, you've got to start here. He said, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Let me give you this last one, this last scripture here. Psalms 2, 8 to 9. He says, ask of me and I will give you nations for your inheritance. Those of you who have a heart for New Zealand, pray for New Zealand. My gosh, they're passing all these weird laws like having breakfast. It's like New Zealand is the guinea pig for passing laws that they shouldn't pass. And the whole world is following New Zealand in that. We need to pray for that country. We need to pray for nations that God has put upon your heart because that's who we are. We're called to have carry a mandate and a message to the world. I see our television ministry is going to blow out into the world. You'll probably say, how is it going to happen? I don't care. You know what? I know it's going to happen. His time and his way. God will bring people who are just genius in television and, and, and all of that stuff. And they'll just come in and say, hey, we feel from God to really help this ministry go to the world. I say, yes, I've been waiting for you. I've been praying for you. I've been calling you forth in the spirit. Where have you been, you stumble little mule? Finally, you're here. And if you're here already, well, come talk to me outside after. He said, ask of me and I'll give you nations for inheritance and the ends of the earth is your possession. I love that. We can possess, we can inherit the nations for God. You shall break them with rod of iron. Speaking of the authority and dominion he's given to us, we shall not be afraid. God is calling us, mandating us. We should go. We have power to break the things that are not of God. And you shall dash them to pieces like Paul's vessel. He's going to do it. All we have to do is know to call the mandate, obey, and go. And God said, I'm going with you and I'll break those things in the power of my name. Here's the last one. You're going to love this one. We're called to be apostolic. What is an apostolic church? Oh, I get excited when I talk about this because it is so close to my heart. Not only that we're called to be in our five-fold ministry church with the apostles undergirding all our ministries and all that we are in this house, but we're called not to be a carbon copy or clone of other church movement. No way, host site. We can borrow, we can learn, but we've got to be who we are. We don't want to allow all these things to come in and just monopolize everything where we just sing, talk, look, act like any other churches in this area. God said, no, you're not a carbon copy of anything. You're original and unique. We are what God has ordained for us to be in the beginning, to be and to do whatever that is. That's what we're going to do. We are built according to his divine blueprints, pattern, and architectural design. God has a design for us. The first time when the God called me and Tina to start Breakthrough Church, we, this is what we were saying. Oh God, should we go under this denomination? He said, no. Oh, should we go under this de denomination? He said, no. And we, we tried. And God said, no, I'm calling you and Tina to bring something unique and different to the earth. And you know what? 14 years later, we're seeing that happening. We are building this house according to his divine blueprint. And you should also take the same lesson for your family. We are pioneers of new things. That's why you should not be surprised. We are trendsetters not following all other trends. Popular songs that are coming out in Christendom today. It doesn't mean that we have to sing it. We're going to sing what is right for us to express our destiny and speak into our purpose in God. We set trends, not follow trends. We said it. We create waves that people can ride, not riding on waves that they created. And some waves, God said, ride on that one. But we don't ride every waves. But we've got to create the waves for people to ride on. And I'm not saying that we ignore the good things that God is doing. No, God will say to us, 
Use that and take that. But be yourself. Don't allow those things to taint you and pollute you from who you are. You're unique. You're different. Trendsetters. We won't succumb to the status quo, but break them and establish God's plumb line. The world say we can't do it. We say we can't. They say you can't take a community program and have the whole of Ipswich come together. Yes, we can. You can't do that. You can't do this. Yes, we can. We're not going to buy into your lies and succumb to status quo. But we're going to break the status quo and establish a new plumb line, which is whatever God is saying through this church, it's going to happen. Somebody say amen. We won't accept average living, but we're going to be the best God's call us to be. And this is the last scripture I want to give you. Behold, the former things have come to pass and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Can I say something here? God saying, some old things have come to pass. You don't have to copy those old things, but there are new things coming. But before I release them, I want to talk to you about it. Oh, new ideas, new creative ideas, new song, new music, new ministry, new expressions of church. God said, before I reveal it, I want to talk to you. You don't have to live in the past. The former things are gone. Behold, new things are coming. Things I declare before they spring forth, I want to whisper those things into your ear. I believe that's what Breakthrough Church is all about. That's what this church is all about. We don't live in the past. We live in the present. And we're going to a great future. In Jesus' name, and everybody say...